So welcome out to uh, session 20. Today is January the 17th, 2023. We're going to have fun tonight. I'm actually kicking around, even though it's not good if you're trying to record all this. Uh, might be frustrating if I do too much of this, but I'm, I, I would like actually some of the discussion to be during the recording session. And uh, if you say anything important, I'll try to repeat it back so that those watching will will uh, know. Because uh, this one handout, session 19 and 20, where I have the eight key points. So again, to repeat, what I attempted to do was to take that third column of all those verses uh, of events happening at the end of Daniel's 70th week, at the end of the last seven years. And then I took those and formed this other document, Session 19 and 20, End Times Bible Study Handout, eight key points from the third column. So that's what we're trying to do tonight. We went through the first four last time, and what I decided to do on the last four is spend the bulk of the time on point number five, because that's a lot of interesting discussion. Uh, mystery, Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots. But before we get into that, I do want to say just a few things about numbers six through eight. And the reason I'm not going to deal a lot with those tonight is we've already dealt with those some, and we will deal with those three more in the future. So, but point number five, it's really kind of confined to two chapters in the book of Revelation, 17 and 18. Even though I do include in parentheses Jeremiah 50 and 51, because if you go over and read those chapters, a lot of those verses read a lot like Revelation 17 and 18. There's a lot in the Bible about Babylon, but I'm talking about what Revelation 17 and 18 is talking about is kind of confined to those two chapters. But the fact that God is closing out the Bible and he chooses to devote two whole chapters to this subject, it's kind of like he's telling us, as we get down to the end, I'm going to focus on the really, really important things. Because the most important are the events of chapter 19 through 22. But chapter 17 and 18, evidently in his mind, is quite important because it is the destruction and judgment on that whole system of religion and politics that usually is married together throughout history, that has been opposed to the truth and the true God and his people, and have done a lot of harm. So it's such a big deal in God's mind that whatever spirit began to develop in Cain, the first rebel, and then grew into the spirit of Nimrod and the Tower of Babel, that whole spirit has continued since that time, as I like to say, side by side, because we also know that spirit. So I think you can already tell, even though we're going to be talking about Mystery Babylon, we're going to be talking about different ideas of where it is on the earth, who it is, a little bit about its history. But I think we miss a lot if we don't realize he's really talking about an underlying spirit of rebellion and defiance against God that may not always be manifested in a particular city or country or empire or ruler, but it's always been there. And that's what's going to come under his hand of judgment. Before we do that, though, I want to say just a few things about points six through eight. Uh, <clears throat> The destruction of Antichrist, in point six, happens at the end of the 70th week, the sounding of the seventh trumpet, 
at the return of Christ on his white horse. And 2 Thessalonians 2.8 says he destroys the Antichrist with the brightness of his coming. And I can almost hear the voice of Jerry Waymire right now and other Greek instructors I've had and watched online and things through the years. When they read that verse, 2 Thessalonians 2.8, with the brightness of his coming, they like to say, by the epiphania of his parousia, <laughs> to use the two uh, Greek words. And epiphania, epiphania, some people, depends on which uh, syllable put the emphasis on and so forth. But epiphania is a real common way to say it. Epi is upon. Phino uh, in the Bible is a word for brightness or uh, light, you know, something that's really bright, glory, splendor. And, and so that's why they translate it as brightness. Uh, some translations translate it as splendor. I think I prefer splendor. He's going to destroy the Antichrist with the splendor of his coming, of his arrival. And that's a quote from Isaiah 11 and 4. But these two figures that, okay, in 2 Thessalonians 2, 8, these two figures, the Antichrist and Christ, Christ will destroy him with the brightness of his coming, have been at odds with each other since Cain and Abel. Or you might even say before that in the Garden of Eden. But especially the spirit of Abel that became the spirit of Seth, his replacement, is the spirit of Christ. The spirit of Cain is the spirit of Antichrist. They're also known as the mystery of godliness and the mystery of iniquity. And they've operated side by side ever since the beginning. And a lot of people don't realize how often this Antichrist figure, or at least his spirit, is spoken about throughout the Old Testament. So that Ezekiel, as late as Ezekiel, almost toward the end of the writings of the Old Testament, could say, ask the question, are you he of whom the prophets have all spoken about? So that tells me that either a lot of people are missing it or they're not seeing the connection or something, that this Antichrist figure has been there all along and mentioned by God in various different ways throughout the Scriptures. We are to look for it. Then the Christ figure has been there all along. And they're headed for a final showdown, a battle to the death, a dramatic climatic battle because God is uh, he's wanting to build it to that uh, dramatic epic conclusion that you know that we see in all the movies so let's look at a couple of verses since we're going to be in Revelation 17 quite a bit tonight let's read a verse there 17:14 about the beast and his uh, ten-nation confederation. These shall make war with the Lamb. See, we, we like to talk a lot about the Battle of Armageddon, God gathering the nations against Jerusalem, the Antichrist trying to destroy the Jews and the saints. But by the time this battle gets to the point of Christ's return, heaven is opened, they say, hide us from the face of him, you know, because evidently God's going to allow the world to see Christ preparing to return and it's going to scare the devil out of everybody, you know. That's when they're going to pray for the rocks to fall on them. Hide us from the face of him because everybody on earth, at least the armies gathered against Jerusalem, when they see that, they're, they're going to reach one conclusion. We chose the wrong side. And whatever they see is going to be powerful enough to really scare them to death, but death will escape them because I think at that point, God wants them alive when Jesus comes on that white horse. He's not going to let them die at that point. 
death will escape them. That's what Revelation 6 says. Uh, because God wants us to reach that point. So that's part of the purpose of the, of the Great Tribulation is to let the spirit of iniquity reach its worst wicked point. And for the mystery of godliness to look like it has lost. And then boom. And of course the mystery of godliness wins. In chapter, to show this further, 1919, because I, I, I like to back up what I say by Scripture if I possibly can. One man said, one preacher said one time, I'm trying to quit telling lies in the pulpit. You know, we throw out a lot of opinions. Someone says, where do you find that Scripture? Well, I, really, I don't know of any particular verse. <laughs> I, I don't like to do that, but sometimes I surmise a little bit. 1919, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him. So at some point, the war ceases to be against each other or against Israel or against the saints or against anyone. All of a sudden they say, we got to stop it. And, and the greatest weapons ever created are going to be pointed at the sky. They're going to literally, I think, try to stop Christ from getting to the earth. But it's not, not going to be a problem for him. Against him who sat on the horse and against his army, and the beast was captured. He is like, you know, the net, very next thought is like, he loses. And, and then one other thing about that, verse 20. The beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast, those who worshipped his enemies. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Do you know of anyone else in the Bible ever cast in their human body into the lake of fire? This is different, isn't it? And I've wondered about this recently. Why, why, why not kill him and then his spirit goes to, you know, goes to the lake of fire? Why take him physically and do you open up the lake of fire so he sees where you're getting ready to throw him? You know, like, here's your destiny. Boom. Live into the lake of fire. One possibility, and I may not be too far off on this, is that the Lord wants to prevent any further attempt, whatever that head wound, death, and supposed resurrection event back in chapter 13 was. Was it real? Was it trickery? Was it deceit by Satan or whatever? He doesn't want any possibility of that reoccurring. So he lets everybody see his body is thrown into the lake of fire. There's no coming back from that. So take that for what it's worth. Um, the marriage of the Lamb takes place. Uh, the only thing I want to say about that, even though it's a glorious event, it's, you know, Closer to the end of the Bible, it's like I'm building toward the more uh, pleasant things now and the more important things. Once Babylon's destroyed, once Antichrist is taken care of, okay, now the marriage and the new city, new earth, and the millennial and, and all that. But just to get another little, what, jab, zinger, I don't even like to think of it that way. Food for thought, let's just describe it a little milder. Another little food for thought for those who might hold to the pre-tribulation rapture, which basically you got to choose is, is the rapture and resurrection of saints. So the rapture is only for living saints, right? And the resurrection is for dead saints. So you got to have the rapture and revelation both. Uh, if, if the rapture is in a pre-tribulation time setting, so you're really looking for escape, escape by an exit. Or as I think I said this last time, or does the Bible seem to emphasize more uh, endurance? Exit or endurance? Um <clears throat> Just a little food for thought on that, though. I wouldn't use it as my main argument if I was discussing it 
person with the pre-tribulation rapture view. But I would point out, even though the book of Revelation is not in exact time order, there is a general time order to it. It is working itself through the tribulation in time. There are some things overlapping that go back and pick up again and come back, go back, pick up. But the general direction of the book of Revelation through the tribulation is forward toward the end. Is there a reason if the pre-tribulation rapture that teaches we're taken to heaven and the marriage celebration takes place in heaven during this seven years, rewarding and marriage, and then we come back with him? Why is a description of that marriage celebration at the end of the book of Revelation? Not at the beginning, not in chapter three, not in chapter four when John is taken up into heaven, which pre-tribulation rapture says that's a picture of the saints being raptured into heaven for the marriage. Then why don't we go into a description of the marriage in chapter 4 and 5 and 6? No. He leaves it till the end, and the general course of events are heading toward that end, and that's where he decides to put a the marriage of the Lamb taking place then. I think it's a pretty good point. Again, I, I wouldn't put my whole argument using that, but I think there is something to that uh, placement of that event at the end of the book of Revelation. And then, of course, number A, which we'll have and we will say over and over again, uh, he will be king over all the earth. But let's go back to number five. The mystery of Babylon the Great. So in Revelation 17, one way of, uh, one of the many ways of looking at the whole Bible is uh, using Charles Dickens' famous title of his book, A Tale of Two Cities. Babylon, Jerusalem. Everything that Babylon represents, it was a literal city. And everything that it represents from the time of the Tower of Babel, rebellion, defiance against God, humanism, uh, we have all the answers. We don't need God. We can take care of ourselves. Uh, the same sin that Adam and Eve committed in the Garden of Eden. We can know a way for ourselves without God. Basically, when they chose to eat that fruit, that knowledge, that the knowledge we will gain will guide us and we can set our own destiny. But anyway, a tale of two cities and what they represent. And then therefore also a tale of two women. So Babylon has a woman connected to her called a harlot, harlot woman. And then Jerusalem has a woman connected to her, the Bride of Christ. And, and that's one way to see the flow of the whole Bible, is through the two women and the two cities. So 17, 1 through 6. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. Let me see. How do I want to approach this? Where do I want to stop and make comments? Let's just read through verse 6. With whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. He carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. So here's this union of this mystery, Babylon the Great, this harlot woman, uh, in union with this beast. But this union is short-lived. They end up turning on each other, trying to destroy each other. Having seven heads and ten horns, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations, the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery. I would stop and say this. 
Her name is not Mystery Babylon. That's often, and I've probably been guilty of saying that to you. Her name is not Mystery Babylon. Her name is Babylon the Great. It's a mystery. It's one of seven or eight mysteries of the New Testament. You know, there's a number of mysteries. There's mysteries of the kingdom. There's the mystery of the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15. There's the mystery of iniquity, the mystery of godliness. There's the mystery of God. Why did God harden Israel and bring the Gentiles in? Uh, there's the mystery of the spiritual gifts. So depending on how you count them, there's seven or eight major mysteries uh, in the Bible, in the New Testament. And this is one of them. Babylon the Great is a mystery, which means the idea of mystery in the New Testament means it is concealed truth, but revealed by the Spirit at the right time to the right person or the right condition of the heart. So its intention is to be revealed. Its intention is not to stay hidden. Its intention is to be open, but not to everyone. You know, that's what Jesus said, to you it's been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom. To them, I speak in parables because I don't want them to understand, because they choose not to understand. So this mystery is Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. Can you imagine the amazement John had as he's looking down through history? And he's the last living apostle. And churches are being uh, established. The gospel's going forth. And martyrs are being killed. And there's lots of stuff going on. And he sees this beast and his horns and this woman riding on the beast. And what's he to make of it? So he's, he's trying to sort all this out. The um, reason I, I thought about opening discussion a little bit early, even during the recording time, is maybe, maybe you've thought about this and shared with me some information I, maybe I hadn't thought about. Uh, there is a... Uh, do we need to... Let me turn this. I stayed on green. Sometimes if it turns it up too quick at once, it's if it's on orange light, that means it's it's like emergency electricity, and the electric rates go up quite a bit. But if you handle it slowly, it stays on green. You better. Um, so this whole thought of mystery Babylon. If you've ever researched it, um, there's um, goes all the way back to the Tower of Babel, that spirit of uh, rebellion that started back there. Some of you have looked at a book by a man named Hislop called The Two Babylons. I own that book. Uh, he does a really good job of showing how that, in his mind, the Roman Catholic system incorporated the ancient Babylonian mystery practices into their practices. Even the way the Pope dresses, their different ceremonies, uh, different drawings, you know, they, they draw from those ancient mystery Babylon religions. I do believe that all through history, the spirit of Antichrist, the spirit of rebellion against God, has manifested itself in the spirit world through human leaders and empires, governments. And not necessarily just in a general way, but in a specific way. For instance, it may have directed most of his energy through Babylon for a while. Uh, Jesus said to the church at Pergamos in, in Revelation, he said, you dwell where Satan's seat is. Well, you can take that general, say it just means it's a wicked place. Or it could mean that, that God knows where the evil spirit world 
concentrates their efforts on the earth. And at that time, Pergamos may have been like the headquarters of the evil spirits working in the world. Uh, then, then many say that it moved to Rome. And certainly in the, uh, the, the government of Rome, with the Caesar system, where the Caesar became a god, and then, of course, the religious system developed later of the Roman Catholic Church system, where basically the Pope is the next thing to God. So you have this civil ruler and this religious ruler, kind of like the Antichrist and false prophet figures. And they're incorporating all this ancient Babylonian religion into their practices. Uh, that old story about Nimrod, some of you have heard that one, that, that Nimrod uh, had a child through his wife named Semiramis, uh, and their son was named Tammuz, T-A-M-M-U-Z. And he is mentioned, by the way, in Ezekiel 8.14, so he was a real false god figure, maybe a real figure in history. It was a scandal of some type. Semiramis, in order to hold on to her power, when Nimrod died before... She gave birth, um, claimed that Tammuz was the resurrected Nimrod. So this whole idea of death and resurrection in a false religion in order to imitate ahead of time the real uh, figure who would die and resurrect Jesus. And so... You know, the uh, Roman Catholic system has uh, been said by, probably by most, to be mystery Babylon the Great. It is called the city on seven hills. Uh, but w one, uh, it's not that I disagree with that totally. It's just I think there's a lot more to it than that. It's not limited to that. Now, down through the Dark Age, the Middle Ages and Dark Ages, when the Catholic Church controlled governments and, and, and controlled people's lives and had, you know, just extreme great power, it would have been much easier to agree to that. But in our day, it's lost a lot of its prestige. It still has a lot of power, a lot of wealth. A lot of people still follow it blindly. So I'm not saying it's... Uh, it's, it's not what he's talking about. But I, I, I think when it says in uh, where does it say? Where does it say it? Here is wisdom. Where does it go on to say that? In chapter 17. Verse 9. I have it in my notes right in front of me, but if you saw my notes. Here is the mind which has wisdom. Seven heads or seven mountains on which the woman sits. So it's kind of, to me, verse 9 is kind of like saying, uh, saying it's Rome is like too easy, too obvious. Uh, what I'm really talking about takes more wisdom than just saying, that's the city of seven hills, they're the great empire, Caesar declares himself God, the Pope comes along later. Obviously, it's the Roman Catholic system. It, it takes more wisdom than that, I think, is what he's trying to say in verse 9. Also, I think what is left out with that equation, I think one reason why that equation is easy for us is because we are so Western-minded. And so, you know, the Roman Empire helped develop the whole Western civilization. And the religion of all that, they had the most money and power was the Roman Catholic Church. So obviously, that's Mystery Babylon. Well, not so fast. Because what Revelation talks about is based in Daniel. That's the foundation. That's the roots. And Daniel, too, reminds us of that great image 
that by the time it gets to the final empire, it's two legs with two feet with ten toes. And within a few hundred years, Constantine moved the capital of the Roman Empire to a new city, modern-day Istanbul, Constantinople, it was called, after him. And he called it himself. He did not call it Constantinople. He called it the New Rome. And it became the Eastern Orthodox Church as a rival to the Western version in Rome. And that leg and that whole religious powerful system became Muslim in the Ottoman Empire. And the Ottoman Empire ruled a large part of the world, that part of the world, all of Northern Africa, the Middle East, and, and all the ancient Babylon and, and uh, Medo-Persia and what's Southern Russia today and the Balkans. I mean, they, they ruled a large and powerful territory for 600 years. So I think there's somewhere to be fit in here in this mystery Babylon of not just confining it to the western leg of that image. Somehow the eastern leg of Islam has to come into play, into what this is all about. Now some people say it's just false Christianity in general. Some people say it's all false religion, so it includes uh, you know Hinduism, Buddhism, and all that. Uh, but a growing number ever since 9-11, but... <laughs> By, uh, by date, that woke a lot of people up to realize we're not including this huge, powerful, evil, religious, political system that has been in operation, you know, for 1,500 years now, conquered a good part of that part of the world, uh, now has surpassed Roman Catholics in number of followers. It's up to 1.7 billion. I think the Catholics are just over a billion. Christendom in general is right about 2 billion or a little bit over 2 billion. So Islam is rivals all of supposed Christianity together and is larger than the Roman Catholic system today. And probably it can be argued holds as much or more sway of political power than the Vatican does. You look at Saudi Arabia, you look at Turkey, you look at Iran, you look at Egypt, you look at even little Dubai, those little wealthy, extremely wealthy little Muslim countries. They hold a lot of sway over the earth right now. What I'm trying to remind you is that that final kingdom of those ten toes, and, and so that's the beast kingdom upon which the woman rides, those ten-toed nations are said to be a mixture of iron and clay. That's why I've, the last 20 years at least or so, I've really seen it more as this attempt at blending Western culture and Islamic culture, and they don't mix very well, as we're seeing in Europe and other places, the oil and water. But somehow they're working together. That's kind of what we're seeing develop. They're finding a way to still work together. The EU and the Muslim nations and, and all the Muslims going up into Europe, somehow it's going to find a way to work. And so it's not just one. It's not just iron or clay. It's both trying to be mixed together. It's the eastern and western leg together. It's the toes on one foot, the toes on the other foot, both needed to make up the whole system. And I think Mystery Babylon is much more a mixture of those two than just one or the other. Um, some people, believe it or not, more than you would think, believe Mystery Babylon is America. Because of the power of America, the economic wealth and power of America, you know, New York City, basically Washington, D.C., New York City to Boston, that whole area is like one big city, uh, pretty much controls the world, finances and politics and militarily and the whole thing. So, you know, there's a point to be made 
uh, and then New York City is said to be, so when 9-11 happened, a lot of people said, that's the city, you know, it's going to be destroyed because they're trying to destroy it right now. Uh, one problem, one major problem I have with that is that it says this woman has a history of, uh, verse 6, drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs. I mean, as bad as America has become, we haven't been slaughtering Christians, you know, for hundreds of years. But the Roman Catholic system has, and the Islamic system has. So, the, so they both fit on that part, don't they? And, and, and one reason why this Islamic part of it is rising up more in my thinking is a simple question. Which one is more likely to kill Christians during the tribulation? The Catholics or the Muslims? And that's where the focus is right here, I think, is that they're still doing it at this point. That's why God judges them. So somehow Islam has to be largely involved in this whole thing. The Ottoman Empire, until World War I, when it finally was broken up, do you know how close they came to conquering all of Europe? On the west through Spain, they conquered Spain, large part of France, until they were stopped. Uh, and then a few centuries later, on the east, all the way up to Vienna, Austria, they were stopped at the gates of Vienna. Uh, and they'd conquered everything up to that point. And the, both sides could have gone either way. It was real close. It was not like, you know, we, we beat them easily and pushed them back. And Europe today easily could have become Islamic, which, what would that mean for us? <laughs> so they had a lot more power and wealth and so forth than, uh, than we realize. Another reason Islam is rising up in my thinking when I look at chapter 17 and 18, and I'm not just confining it to the Pope and the Western leg and all that, the Catholic Church, is because she unites for a time with the beast. Actually, she's riding the beast, and the beast is doing her bidding. These ten nations confederated with Antichrist, to me, when it names them in Psalms and uh, Ezekiel 38, places like that, they're the nations surrounding Israel. They're Islamic nations. Uh, I guess it's likely that the Pope would join up with those Islamic nations. They'd work together for a while. They'd turn on each other. That's a possible scenario. But, you know, I, I'm thinking for them to actually unite together, uh, at least for a time, uh, is, Islam is involved in a big way. <clears throat> Let me talk a little more, and then I'm going to open it up before my time is up. It does say in verse, at the end of verse 1, uh, she sits on many waters. Well, Rome's kind of in the middle of the country, so it's not really sitting on many waters, but it's kind of surrounded by a lot of water. A lot of people say Babylon the Great is literal Babylon rebuilt. And there have been some attempts through history to rebuild it, but it's, it's a wasteland right now. And it's not surrounded by many waters. The Euphrates River is much less than it used to be. Uh, a place like Saudi Arabia, and I'd like to talk about this a little bit. Uh, if you go to chapter 17, verse 10 and 11, there's agreement on most of this, disagreement on the end of it. There are also seven kings, five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come. When he comes, he must continue a short time. The beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth, is of the seven, and is going to perdition. Most Bible interpreters are in agreement that the five that have fallen and one is. So that gives us a clue. One is, and that's the Roman Empire. So we, we can uh, identify that easily. So it's talking about empires that have harmed God's people, especially Israel, Jerusalem. 
So five have fallen. So that's fairly easy too. You know, so you have the Assyrians and then you have the Babylonians. Then you have the Medo-Persians. Then you have the, the Greeks. And then you have Rome. Um, I did not start with Egypt. Egypt is before Assyria. So Rome is the sixth. It's the one that is. Five have fallen. One is. The belief that the ten-toed kingdom and the mystery of Babylon and all that is the Roman Catholic Church and, and Europe and all that, like a lot of us grew up with. I mean, we just, we just all said that's Europe, that's the, that's the common market, and it was easy when they only had ten nations. Unfortunately, they have like 20-some now, you know, the EU, so it makes it a little more difficult. Um, look at the wording of verse 11 and 10 again. So we grew up being taught that the final empire, the beast kingdom, the ten-toed kingdom, would be the revived Roman Empire. That's what we were all taught. We all accepted it. We all just, you know, because we have such a Western culture view. But look at the wording here that makes that really difficult. The other has not yet come. That's number six, right? Number six has not yet come. So you can say, well, that's the revived Roman Empire. But remember, Daniel chapter 7, in describing the final empire, said it's different than the others. Rome was big and powerful, but they weren't a whole lot different than the other empires in most ways. But the Ottoman Empire, the Islamic Caliphate that ruled for 600 years over the Bible lands, at least the Middle East, which is what the Bible is a lot about, um, did control it. And they were different, as Daniel 7 describes them. Now, here's kind of the clincher for me. Uh, when he comes, he must continue a short time. And the beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth and is of the seventh. So if the, sixth, if, the, if the seventh is the revived sixth, in other words, if the seventh is the revived Roman Empire, then what's the eighth? Is the Roman Empire revived twice? You know, you'd have to have like a double. No, but it says the eighth is of the seventh, not of the six. So whatever the seven is, the eighth is like it, not of the sixth. So that leads me more away from like a revived Roman Empire view to more of it back to where we, I think we're supposed to be, a Middle Eastern geographical view. I think that's what the Bible's trying to tell us. Stay close to Jerusalem. <laughs> the center of the world, you know, all that. That's where I'm talking about. That's where the beast is going to rule from. That's where he's going to try to conquer and all that. I want to, uh, I keep making a promise. So I've, I've got, I need to bring this up. I want to give you all a, an assignment for your own studies. Maybe some of you have already looked into this. It's fairly new, so it's kind of new information. So I, I would say about the city. So it says it's a city. One thing to say about Saudi Arabia is kind of, they're kind of like the most respected of all the Islamic, they have, you know, in some ways the most power and wealth, is that Mecca as a city, one way to look at it, it is the home or the headquarters to 1.7 billion Muslims. Rome is the home city to one billion Catholics. So there's something to be said about looking further toward the Middle East. Study, research this 
a new city being built in Saudi Arabia called Neom, N-E-O-M. It's been in the works for several years, but it's been delayed as building projects often are. Uh, they hope to have it finished in 2030. They hope to have the opening phase opened several years before that. Uh, it is, it's going to be a quadrant of four mega cities, a total of nine million people. They're building it out in the wilderness, in the desert. If you look on a map, they're building it. Well, let me say this. This is four mega cities comprising nine million people. They're building it from the ground up in the desert. The main city is called the Line, and it is a, a single city that is 110 miles long. The start of it at the Red Sea is where many people think Israel crossed over from Egypt by coincidence. As it continues, it almost connects to where most people now say Mount Sinai is. Isn't it where Israel crossed, where Mount Sinai is? They're building this line city. It's going to go 110 miles long. Why do they call it the line? It's only 650 feet wide. So that it can have just several fast track rails on the length of it because the goal is to be completely green, no roads and no cars. Anywhere you need to go along that line, it's only 200 yards wide. You should get on these rails and go the length of it as fast as, as, fast as they can go. 1,600 feet high. They hope that as much as possible will be operated by artificial intelligence instead of humans. It's going to be the first truly smart city, just like your smartphone. A whole city of 9 million people is going to operate just like a smartphone. Man's tribute to himself. Very much like the image in Daniel 3, in the Hebrew children in the fiery furnace. Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar this great image, and you are the head of gold. Aren't you impressed? Well, he probably was at the moment. Then Daniel starts talking about these other empires that are going to come along. What does that mean when you get to thinking about it over the next few weeks? That means we're going to be destroyed, overthrown. Other empires are going to come along. So what does he do in chapter 3? He says, I don't want to be just the head of gold. I want to be the whole image. So he builds this 90-foot image of himself. Everyone has to bow down to it. That's what human nature is like. I think that's what this is intended to be. It's man's tribute to himself. Of what man can accomplish without God. Or, as they might say, by the power of Allah because they will give him the full credit, not God. And uh, part of that city, that line city, they plan on building the tallest building ever built. Shades of the Tower of Babel. <clears throat> because the energy behind it will be pride, human ingenuity, technology, of what can be accomplished apart from any God directing us. Certainly not the God of the Jewish Bible or the Christian Bible, but maybe by the power of Allah of the Koran Bible. So those are just things that keep further drawing me toward this Islamic direction. It's not that I'm rejecting the whole Western, Roman Catholic, wicked wealth of the West, the corruption of the West. That's all mixed into it. But it's not limited to that. It's 
is mainly what I'm trying to say. Comments on this that maybe we can actually discuss a little bit in the recording. Anybody? I'm giving you a chance to be on camera. Maybe just like this is how I about it. It's all quite completed. I mean, the return sounds like, it seems like it's going to be about this. Yeah, but if, if what we've been talking about is true, the Lord may come just before they're finished and put a stop to it. I'll just add a, a, a more like, thought since 9 11, you mentioned that we've been preaching focused on Europe, I think. And it seems like Revelation is about Jerusalem. And it's focused there as people are. And so the spread it to Rome and to Europe and America. I need to see the whole picture. Yeah, I was talking to Gary a little bit before we started. The World Economic Forum is meeting this week in Davos, Switzerland, you know, where all the elites of the world government and finance and technology and everything. And their whole purpose in meeting there is they're pretty open about saying we are the elite. It is up to us to figure out the world's problems and then uh, deliver it back to the people, to the countries, to the government systems of each country in a way that convinces them we are right and no other way should be considered that we have met, we're the smartest, we're the brightest, we're the most successful. And and this so this is and of course it's all in the direction of socialism and green and, and all that and wokeness and, and all these things we're facing today. Uh, because as always it's about centralizing power. That's always the goal of these things. And uh, so they're meeting over there right now, and which usually means it's going to cost us a lot of money down the road. But the funny thing about it is, you know, you read these kind of jokes about they're all there pushing the green environment uh, methods for us to impose on us as they all fly over there in their private jets talking about how we need to lessen our carbon footprint. So I'm thinking about this city being built in Saudi Arabia, 9 million people and it's all green and they're not, and it's Saudi Arabia, you know, oil country and their goal is to use no oil for energy. All natural solar and wind and all that, whatever else they come up with, maybe nuclear, who knows. But, okay, it's 9 million people. They don't plan on using any oil-based, anything anywhere in that city. But they're building an airport so people all over the world can go there because they plan on it being like the, the capital of the world for entertainment and gambling and whatever else they plan on incorporating into it. They've already been, just to show you, this is not like a pipe dream that's just in the very beginnings. They already have been awarded the... I may have the year wrong, 2028 Asian Olympic Games. So the world is recognizing that's the future of the world. Uh, and so they, and they wanted, they, they sought that, they sought permission to, to host that partly so that it would push everyone toward a date we have to have this much finished. So let's work toward that goal. Uh, so research that some. However that figures into all of this, we're not quite sure yet. But it is right. It's just so interesting to me that it's right in the area where Israel crossed over and they received the, the God met them at the Mount Sinai. And right in that backyard area is this whole uh, glorified to man city being built and uh, they're going to try to receive all the credit and then it's in it's in that part of the world where the where the capital city to 1.7 billion muslims are mecca and medina of course close by and then it's between them and jerusalem so just the geography of it is is kind of 
there's something there about the geography of it that, that if they're going to do it, it's almost like God is pushing them toward that exact location because he has plans for them in the future in that location. So if you come up with anything more than that, I haven't done a lot of research on it, but it's starting to really get on my radar screen. And uh, what little I know of it is uh, ominous.